Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for our Bible study today. Thank you for your children who are here. Thank you for the interest you have given us in studying your word. And thank you, Lord, because every time we come, your spirit is always here. And for those who are interested in learning your word, you are ever ready to make your truth known to them. Therefore, Lord, we're praying tonight that the truth of the word will be very clear to every heart in Jesus' name. We're praying, Lord, that reading the word, explaining the word, applying the word, that your spirit will make it penetrate into the soil of every heart in Jesus' name. That this truth you bring to us in your word will so challenge us and change us, turn us around and transform our lives so that the possession you have prepared for us will be ours in Jesus' name. Be glorified in the Bible study tonight. Lord, we pray that the way you inspire these writers of the scriptures and they reveal the truth unto your people, we're praying in the same way you inspire the speaking and the hearing so that we'll get the best out of your word in Jesus' name. How we pray, Lord, that you clear everything away from our hearts that will hinder us from getting the very best out of your word tonight in Jesus' name. Whether we are newcomers or we are old timers, I pray that the freshness of the word will be revealed to everyone. It will do us good in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. I just wanted a bigger Amen. Thank you very much. We're looking at in a Bible study at Second Peter. I'm reading chapter 1. We're looking at verses 3 and 4, but I'm going to read from verse 1. Second Peter chapter 1, from verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us, who the knowledge through this righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord, according as his divine power, has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world, through lost. In this passage of scripture we're looking at today, you can find out in verse 3, it says, according as his divine power has given unto us. And then it says, what he has given unto us, he has given unto us all things. Then he mentions the areas of the things he has given unto us, all things, number one, pertaining to life. Number two, all things pertaining to godliness. And then it says, it is true. The knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the knowledge of him that has done something already, who has called us out of something into another thing. He has called us out of the corruption of the world and he has called us into the glory of the kingdom of God. He has called us to glory and to virtue. And then he says in verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these promises we might be partakers we might be co-heirs we might be inheritors we might be possessors of the divine nature because we have escaped the pollution the corruption the defilement the evil that's in the world the corruption that is in the world through laws and you will see that word there he has given and he mentions it again he has given that's the reason we titled the bible study tonight divine possession for believers of like precious faith because he says in verse one simon peter a servant an apostle of jesus christ and then he defines the people he's writing to he mentions them and he says it's to them that have obtained like precious faith. That's the reason the title of the subject of the teaching tonight is Divine Provision for Believers of Like 
precious faith. Follow me now. And we're looking at this word, given. To give, he gave, he has given. In Romans chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, reading there in verse 32. Romans 8, 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Can you see there it says, Christ is so precious. It's the very glory and the crown of heaven. And Almighty God, the Father in heaven, has given the only begotten Son to us. If he has not spared his only begotten Son, and he has given us his only begotten Son, how shall he not with him freely, gratis, give us all things? All things pertaining to life, all things pertaining to godliness. In First John chapter 5, First John chapter 5, I'm reading verse 11. And this is a record that God has given to us eternal life. And this life is in his son. You remember what we're studying? He has given unto us all things pertaining to life and pertaining to godliness. And here he tells us, this is a true record. Because God has given us eternal life and is giving us peace of mind and he has given us pardon and he has given us salvation. He has given us righteousness. He has given us all things pertaining to eternal life, all things pertaining to godliness, righteousness and holiness in Romans chapter 5 verse 5. Romans 5, 5, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Think about it. It's given us Jesus Christ. And in Jesus Christ, he has given us eternal life. In that eternal life, he has given us peace of mind. And in that peace of mind, he has given us the rest in our soul. Now we can follow in the will of God. He has not only given us Jesus Christ and eternal life, he has given us the Holy Ghost. And then through that Holy Ghost, the fruit of the Spirit, love, is shed abroad in our hearts. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, reading verse 32. And it says here, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so, is also the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. As you search your scriptures, as you look at the word of God, and you follow through on what he has given, he has given, he has given, then you realize how many things were given. In fact, it says all things. And here it tells us even the power of the Holy Ghost and the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, and the guidance of the Holy Ghost, and the comfort of the Holy Ghost, and everything in the ministry of the Holy Ghost he has given unto us as well. No wonder that Peter writing to those people of like precious faith, he said, he has given unto us all things, all things pertaining to life, all things pertaining to godliness. In fact, he tells us in, in uh, John chapter 17, John chapter 17, and in verse 22, it says, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Think about that. Even the glory that the Father gave unto the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, I have given them. Then he says, for that purpose, he says, that they may be one, even as we are. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man. The things which God has provided, has prepared, has given to them for them that love him, but God has revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. In verse 12, now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things which are freely given to us of God. It tells us it's provided so many things that eyes have not seen, ears have not had, neither entered into the heart of man. The things prepared for the people that love God. But the Spirit of God that comes in us is revealing to us day by day the things that are freely given unto us. And as there is sin, as you come to the Bible study tonight, you are wondering, all these things that the Lord has prepared for us, because it says, according, 
as his divine power. He has given unto us all things pertaining to life and pertaining to godliness, so that through the knowledge of him that called us out of the world, out of the degradation, out of the pollution of the world, he has called us to glory and to virtue. We can now be partakers of the divine nature because, because of that divine power, because of that provision, and because of the experience we have with the Lord. We have escaped the pollution that's in the world through laws. I told you last week that the first epistle of Peter was written to these believers because they were undergoing persecution. They had like precious faith for the Jewish believers. They had similar salvation for the Jewish believers. But they also had similar persecution like the Jewish believers and they needed encouragement. But I need to tell you this. Persecution never can destroy true faith. It can destroy counterfeit faith, faith that is fake, faith that is not genuine, faith that is not deep-rooted in the Word of God, but mark it. Persecution can never, never destroy true faith. It can refine it. It can strengthen it. It can increase it. It can establish it. But persecution never destroys True faith. And when the devil saw that persecution alone could not destroy these people, he then brought in false prophets. And that's the challenge that the Christians face in this um, second epistle uh, to, the, um, to these Christians in Asia Minor. And it's because of the challenge, because of the opposition, because of the infiltration of these false prophets that the apostle was now writing to them. But before he wrote to them, before he starts explaining, how they will deal with the false prophecies and the false teaching. He wanted to let them know what they already possessed. The possession of the believer. That's why he's writing to them in these two verses we have read together. The divine provision for believers of like precious faith. Come back to Second Peter chapter 1 verses 3 and 4. According as his divine power has given unto us, not just unto them, and this is true in every generation. And this is true in every, every time. Before the Lord will come, he has given from the time at Calvary that he died for us, and he said, it is finished. He provided everything now. He has given unto us all things. Mark it in your Bible, all things. In fact, can I challenge you that when you get back home, take a concordance and find out all things, all things, all things in the New Testament. It's an interesting study. We don't have time to do that tonight. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these he might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through laws. There are three points we are going to consider. Number one, God's power and his sufficiency. God's power and a sufficiency number two great promises to heavenly minded saints great promises to heavenly minded saints can, can i tell you something when you look at the new testament it calls the believers saints in fact as we check out from acts of the apostles when paul the apostle was persecuting the believers he said i did many evil things against the saints at Jerusalem. And when they were going to collect offering for them, he said they were collecting offering for the saints because of the famine that came. As you come to Romans chapter 1, it says you are called to be saints. And then as you go on in the epistles, you'll find out the believers are called saints. You know why? You know, there are people that do not understand the word of God. Nominal Christians they are. It's when people die, they call them Saint Augustine or Saint Peter, or Saint John, or Saint so-and-so, after they have died, they seek is the death that makes them to become a saint. It's the death of Jesus Christ. And your faith in the death of Jesus Christ and the purification and the cleansing and, and the purging that the blood of Jesus Christ does in your life while you are still alive and you are shining as light and you are the salt of the earth and the righteousness of Christ is imparted and imputed unto you. He that knew no sin, but he became a sin offering for us, that we might be the righteousness of God in him. And when you are walking like that, in righteousness, the New Testament calls you sage. 
great, great promises to heavenly minded saints. Point number three, gratitude, grateful partakers of his holiness and sanctification. You know, those partakers of the holiness of God, and they're so grateful that God will count them worthy and grant them the privilege of being partakers of the holiness of God and the sanctification experience. Grateful partakers of holiness and of sanctification. Come back to point number one. God's power and his sufficiency. Come back to this verse 3 again. You know something? It's something to wonder. We've read that verse 3 before in the introduction. We read it again when mentioning the points and we're going to read it again. You know sometimes what helps you is this. You take a passage of scripture and you might wonder, how do we develop a, you know, a Bible study like this on two verses? The way you do that is read those two verses over and over. Read it the first time, and the second time, and the third time. And then you begin to, some things begin to jump out of the passage. And then begin to look at the words one by one, according as his divine power. What kind of power is that? How great is that power? What has that power done before? According as his divine power, he has given. Check up that word given. I give unto you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And then he says, I give you power over all the power of the enemy. And then he gave Israel repentance and forgiveness. And you begin to check up just that word given. And then it says all things. You begin to check that up. And it says all things pertaining to life. You check up life and godliness. You check your check up godliness and godly and then it's through the knowledge of him that has called us unto glory and to virtue when you read it over and over and over that's how we study the bible you know there are people that can say i read 10 chapters of the bible every day uh-huh we read 10 chapters of the bible every day did you study those 10 chapters did you get something out of those 10 chapters? That's the reason why we're reading it again. Follow me now. Verse 3 again. According as his divine power, not according to my human weakness, not according to your human background, according as his divine power. He has given unto us. He has given it already. It's just for me to claim it now. It's just for me to receive it now. He has given us all things pertaining to life and pertaining to godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue. God's power and his sufficiency. As we measure the power of the almighty God, do I need to tell you that that power has no limit? Because that's the power that created the whole of the universe. And that's the power that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead. That's the power that can recreate man. Just, just get hold of your life, turn you around, transform your life, and recreate you. That power has no limit. There is no limit to what divine power can do in us and through us. According as his divine power, he has given us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness. All things pertaining to life, what does that mean? It means pertaining to eternal life. It means pertaining to a spiritual life. What are the things pertaining to eternal life? Pertaining to a spiritual life? Forgiveness? Cleansing? Salvation? Conversion? Transformation? If any man be in Christ, what's the next thing? He's a new creature. That's life in Christ. He is a new creature. It says all things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. And in that life, in that new life, in that eternal life, there is righteousness. All these things are ours according as his divine power. And then it says, he has even given us all things pertaining to godliness. That means a godly nature, a godly life, holiness as well. And look at it now and see what the power of the Lord is able to do, is sent to do. It's meant to do in your life, in my life, in your family, and in my family. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, I'm reading verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power? To us world, it's not just the great power in isolation. Great power among the angels. Great power up in the ivory tower in heaven. Unreachable for me or for you. According, he says, what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards what who believe according to the working of his mighty power 
that he is able to make that power work effectually, effectively, in a fruitful manner in your life and in my life. Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm actually going to verse 20, but I'm going to back up from verse 16 so you can get the understanding of the whole thing that he will grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man how many times you know you want to do the will of god you make resolution you make decision you make consecration you even pray i want to do the will of god but you are not strong within you're very weak within i say i wish i was strong I wish I could resist all these temptations coming across my way. I wish I could overcome all this inner weakness. Yes, it's available for you, and that's why we're here tonight, because the divine power can walk in you, and you'll be strengthened by might, by the Spirit of God in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love. Ah, is that not part of the problem? We're not grounded and rooted in his love we are not grounded and rooted in the love of god for me in the love of god for you and we're shaky we're unstable we don't understand the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of the love of god for you to send jesus christ for you if you want to be strong in the inner man you must understand and be grounded and be rooted in the love of God that even the wind that the devil may make to blow upon you will not shake you from the root and from the foundation of that love of God for you. In verse 18 it says, may be able to comprehend, may be able to understand with all saints. That's the word again, saints, children of God righteous people purified people that will be able to understand to comprehend with all saints what's the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of christ which passes knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of god now in verse 20 now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or seek according to the power that worketh in us that's the power able to do able to do all things whatever we ask and whatever we think is able to save is able to cleanse is able to strengthen us is able to make us live a new life according to the power that divine power that works in us in colossians chapter 1 colossians chapter 1 verse 11 strengthened with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness in verse 29 it says over here where unto I also labor striving according to his walking, which walketh in me mightily. In fact, as you go to the Old Testament, it tells you in the Old Testament there's nothing. God cannot do. And of course, you know that God says, I am the same, I change not. In Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. There in verse 17. For thus says in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17, it says, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth. By thy great power and stretched out arm, there is nothing too hard for thee. And you know, there are people that tell you you cannot be free from sin. There are people that so man is so weak. And salvation is, you know, so ordinary to them that they do not understand that when you become born again, no matter how you have been a slave of Satan and a slave of sin, the power of the cross of Jesus Christ and the power that raised him from the dead will come into your life and blow away all the very strongholds of sin and Satan, all the shackles of your, your, your besetting sin, blow everything away because there is nothing God cannot do. Maybe habitually you are being adultery, habitually in fornication, habitually in stealing, habitually in lying, and you feel you could not deliver yourself. This power we are talking about, according as his divine power, he has given unto us all things pertaining to eternal life, life in Christ, new life, eternal life, life without sin, because that's a prophecy that the angel said, thou shalt call his name Jesus, because he shall save his people from their sins. When you come to the 
the Lord, this power works in your life and sets you free from sin. Not only that, this is the power that can sanctify you and make you holy and take away that Adamic nature. Do you know there are people that say, no, there is nothing like sanctification, nothing like holiness. Man is so weak and temptations are so great and the world is so corrupt and the world is so evil that it's impossible for us to be holy and pure and righteous and sanctified. Well, we're not talking about what you do in your own strength. We're talking about the power of God according as his divine power. He has given unto us all things that pertain unto life eternal and all things that pertain unto godliness, holiness, and righteousness. What a challenge that we can go to God and say, God, the Adamic nature is inside here. This inbred sin is inside here. And theologians tell us you cannot remove it. That this inbred sin will live with us until we die. And we want to come to you and claim your authority of your, on the authority of your word that you said, according to your divine power. You have given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness. If I cannot be sanctified today, if I cannot be made holy today, if I cannot be so pure like Enoch, like Daniel, like John, if I cannot be as perfect as my Father which is in heaven, as Christ has commanded, where is the divine power? But God can do everything. That's why it says you have created the whole earth by your great power and stretch out arm. There is nothing that is too hard for you. Do you believe that? I said, do you believe that? And look at what Jesus Christ himself said about the power of his own heavenly father. In Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, verse 25 and verse 26, it says, when his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, who then can be saved? And you know, sometimes you look at some people that are sinners, and you say, these ones, they're so hard, and they're so tough, can this one ever be saved? Why even waste time preaching to them and talking to them? Can there be any supernatural change in their lives? And we want to give up. That's how the church gave up on Saul of Tarsus. And nobody even went to preach to that man. They won't knock at his door. They won't tell him about life eternal. They will not tell him about Jesus Christ, the Savior, and the sin bearer, and the one that's able to turn our lives around. But when they will not, then Jesus went to him and called him by name. And that man was converted. And from the very first day of his conversion, the evidence of that conversion was there. Calling upon the Lord and praying, and turning around, and living a new life that the person that persecuted us before is now proclaiming and preaching the gospel. And they gave, they gave glory to God. I'm telling you that there is nothing God cannot do. That's why it says in verse 26, and Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, tell me out loud, with God, all things are possible. If language means what it says, if Jesus told the truth, it's possible to get saved. It's possible to be free from sin. It's possible to be free from adultery. It's possible to be free from fornication. It's possible to be free from the inbred sin. It's possible to be sanctified. For with God, all things are possible. It tells us then in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. I'm reading to you from verse 11. Titus chapter 2 in verse 11. Here it tells us uh, what the salvation of God, what it does when it comes. Because it says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And when that power, when it saves you, and when that power, when he gives you something of life eternal, when that power, when he gives you something of godliness, righteousness, and holiness, he is able to keep you, that same power, he is able to keep you in that Christian experience in First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Who are kept by the power of God through faith. Kept by the power of God through faith unto that final salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And uh, Peter tells us in the passage we're looking at today that all you see, the power connected with the promises will bring the provision. The power connected with the promises 
will bring the provision. That's what leads us to point number two. Great promises to heavenly minded saints. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. That by these great and precious promises. By these exceedingly great and precious promises. By these many promises in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, by these promises exceedingly great, exceedingly precious, that are yea and amen in Christ, by these promises given to us and established for us on the cross of Calvary, by these promises that I don't have to work for anymore because Christ paid the whole price, by these great and exceeding promises, by these promises that are even greater than the promises that are given, in the, greater than the promises of the old covenant, greater than the promises given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, greater than the promises given to all those worthies of old, by these great exceeding precious promises he has now given us something else by them we become partakers of the divine nature and we escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. when you study bible like this and you understand you go out and live in victory you go out and you live over your temptation, over your trials. You're, you're not, you know, a weak a Christian, apologetic Christian, and you're, you know, you know, walking, I want to be a Christian, I want to be a child of God. Is this fornication that will not leave me? I want to be a child of God. Why it not for the pool of the world upon my life? I want to be a Christian. It's just this worldliness that is troubling me. I want to be a Christian. It's because of, you know, the weakness of my flesh. I know my weakness. I know myself. When, when you know the word of God and you understand, he has given us us exceedingly great and precious promises and by that we become partakers of that divine nature and we escape and then the corruption of the world and all the things of the devil and all the temptations and the, and the pollutions and all those things cannot tie us down and you say i have escaped everybody say i have escaped, I have escaped. when this divine power gets hold of you and turns you around and transforms your life and you say temptation come and let me deal with you all the things the devil was using before to get you back it's your old sin it's your old life you say no i've graduated from that now i have escaped that thing cannot make me dirty and corrupt and polluted anymore because according as his divine power he has given me all these great and precious promises that now i become a partaker of the divine nature not satanic nature not human nature not the nature of weakness of the divine nature and i've escaped the pollutions in the world that is coming through loss look at the promises some of the promises of God, we cannot exhaust the promises in one day, in one week, in one month, even in one year. In Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, I'm reading verse 21, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save, he shall deliver, he shall rescue his people from their sins. You know, it takes you away from the sin, and you're not in the sin anymore. Great promise, great promise. In Hebrews chapter 8, Hebrews chapter 8, I'm reading there in verse 6. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6, But now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, that by, by, that by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. And then in verse 10, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. And I will write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. You know, there are people that excuse their, their sin, their fault, their wrong deeds, their evil doing. And they will say, oh, you, you know, not everybody knows the Bible as you are quoting this Bible. I didn't know that thing was wrong. I didn't know it was wrong to, you know, go that direction. I'm sincere. I love God. I love the Bible. I'm a member of this church. My problem is, I don't remember. Ah, when this divine power gets hold of you, look at the promise of God. This is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. Says the Lord, I will write, I will put my laws in their mind. The Lord will put it in your mind. If you come to the Lord and you claim this power, the divine power that does a mighty thing in your life 
and that turns your life around and you claim the promise of God, it says he will put his laws in your mind and write them in your heart and he will be your God and you will be the people of God and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least unto the greatest. And we will not be, you know, after you coercing and, 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 you know, pushing and dragging and talking and explaining and advising and pleading and begging. You will know the word of God. You will know that a child of God, whosoever is born of God, does not commit sin. The spirit of God in you will be reminding you, a child of God cannot do that. A child of God cannot speak that way. A child of God cannot drink that. A child of God cannot wear that. A child of God cannot have that kind of friendship. Because he puts the law, the word, in your heart. And then he tells us in verse, in verse 12, he says, For I will be merciful unto their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. In Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Reading in verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 30. We are looking at some of the exceedingly great and precious promises. By which promises will become partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption, the pollution, the evil that's in the world through laws. In um, Deuteronomy chapter 30, I'm reading there in verse 6. A great promise. A mighty promise. A promise that the Lord wants you to claim. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Uh, look up here. As we read all these promises, can, can you feel convenient? Can you feel justified that you read all these promises and you never do anything about them? That the promises that give you victory over sin, external sin, in what sin? The promises that make you victorious every day of your life, whether you're in your family or outside your family, the promises, the provision that the Almighty God has made to make you a victor over sin and over Satan, over temptation, over every negative thing coming against your life, the promises are there already given to you. Can you feel convenient? These promises are there. Just take a step of faith and just pray a little and claim them and victory is yours. And you are defeated every day by sin, every day by temptation, every day by Satan. And, and the Lord is saying, look at the promise, look at the promise, exceeding great, precious promises. That if you just take care and take note of those promises, hold them, embrace them, believe them, accept them, appropriate them, you'll be victorious. Can you feel convenient for falling onto sin, falling to sin, falling to sin every day? And yet the promises are nearby. Look at it once again. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. Stop there. To love the Lord thy God with all thine heart. If you are married, I want to remind you, when you, when you are in courtship and you love that lady, or maybe, lady, you loved that man. And you will talk and talk and talk. Then they will look at the time. Can we go now? Eh, just one point more. And then you talk and talk. And the sister said, look at the time. Oh, can we go now? Eh, ju just one point more. Because of the law. Do you remember? Answer me. <laughs> there you are. If you love God, you'll have quiet time. If you love God, you'll study this Bible. If you love God, you'll not be tired when Bible study is going on. If you love God, you'll be awake when the word of God is being read. If you love God, the love affair between you and the Almighty will be so rich, will be so deep, that the word of God will just enrich your life. But you know, it takes circumcision of heart that the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that thou mayest live. And then he tells us very clearly, there's no, par no parable now in, in this next verse we're going to read so very clear in Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verses 74 and 75. That he will grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear. See this promise here. See this promise here. Uh, look up here. You know, if we have fear in our hearts, there's no way. No way you can serve God the way you want to serve God. You, you want to move forward like this, and the fear will draw you back. Maybe the fear of your wife. 
If I consecrate like that, I'm going to get into trouble with my wife. Maybe the fear of your husband, if I, I, I know the truth of the word of God. I know the standard of the word of God, and my heart is yearning. But I'm hooked already. I'm hooked to this man. And this man is not, is, not, is not a genuine Christian. And maybe he says he's born again, but he is not, as, he is not like I want him to be. And if I, if I don't carefully practice my Christianity, this man is going to make trouble for me. If he doesn't make trouble, his mother will make trouble. There is no way you can serve God to the extent that you know when there's fear in your heart. And the fear of hunger, the fear of losing my job, the fear of losing my friends, the fear of losing favor with people, the fear of the people that love me and like me, they may not like me anymore, the fear of creating enemies for myself, and the fear of all that they can do against me. If you have fear in your heart, there's no way you can serve God. But look at the promise of God, exceeding great and precious promise. It says over here that he will grant unto us, I pray he will grant it to you. That we be delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our lives. You know, when this promise is fulfilled in your life, the rope that the world has tied around your waist and your leg, and they are pulling you back from making deeper consecration from going further in the Lord and from serving the Lord with all your heart, with abandonment. All that fear, once the rope is caught, will see you born for Christ. You'll be on fire for the Lord. You need this promise, my brother. You need this promise, my sister, that you will grant unto us that we've been delivered out of the hands of our enemies, enemies of holiness, enemies of righteousness, enemies of consecration, enemies of dedication, enemies of being hot for the Lord, enemies of being out and out for the Lord, enemies of 100% being sold out to the Lord, that we've been delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him. Just serve him, not serve the world. Serve him, not serve the flesh. Serve him, not serve your interests. Serve him, that we might serve him without fear, in holiness and in righteousness, not only one day and not before men, before God. And all the days of our lives, I pray before you go tonight, God will do it in your life. In Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5, I'm reading to you from verse 6. Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst at righteousness, for they shall be filled. Filled with righteousness. We're looking at exceeding great and precious promises. Hey, look at the promise that the Lord is giving you here. That it can fill your heart with so much righteousness, there will be no unrighteousness in any part of your life. In John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Exceedingly great and precious promises. Reading verse 17. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him. For he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Think about the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the, from the dead to come and dwell in your mortal body and, and to guide you every time and to instruct you every time and to teach you every time. That's the promise here. In fact, in that chapter, it tells us in verse 20, in verse 20 at that day, ye shall, shall ye know that I am in the Father and ye in me and I in you. Can you think of this promise, the Holy Ghost in you, in verse 17? And then Christ in you, in verse 20, in verse 23, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. And we, the Father and I, God Almighty, we, will come unto him and make our abode with him. Ah, that finalizes everything. When the Father is inside there, and the Son is inside there, and the Holy Ghost is inside there, tell me what temptation will defeat you. That's why it says, he's giving unto us all these promises. And we become partakers of the divine nature. The Father is there, living inside there. And the Son, with his power, is living inside there. And the Holy Ghost, with his power, is living inside there. That's why, because of the Trinitarian power, living within us, the power of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost within. That's why we escape the world, the, the pollution that is in the world through laws. It tells us in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians. 
chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame, without blemish, without spot, before him in love. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any sort of thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. I pray you will give God a chance to walk in your life. We go to point number three now, grateful partakers. Grateful partakers of his holiness and sanctification. We come to 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. 2 Peter 1, for whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be, part ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through laws. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that although the world is corrupt through and through, the world is corrupt through and through. Uh, get into the system of the world if you are walking in the world and you are not walking, you know, for yourself. You'll find corruption no matter where. And get into the politics of the world, you are going to find corruption there through and through. And get into, is it even an educational system? Get there, you are going to find corruption through and through. And even in your community, as you live in your community, you are going to find corruption there through and through. And even when you are self-employed, and you have to, you know, drop a file there, they have to sign this for you, sign this for you, you'll find corruption through and through. And so, it says, well, we're surrounded with corruption all around. And then there are some people that will try to, you know, tell us without the sound doctrine, and without the fullness of the preaching of the word of God, and they try to promise us that we can be free from the corruption. In Second Peter chapter two, verse uh, verse eighteen, for when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they are law, they entice, they deceive through the laws of the flesh, and through much wantonness. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promise them liberty. They themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage. While those preachers, you know, they are preachers who can talk, but they just, they pick one verse, they read that verse, then they leave that verse aside as if God will read your word just to fulfill all righteousness, just to fulfill religious duty. We have read that, and then they take off, they begin to talk. And they talk, 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 sugar-coated mouth, illustration here, illustration there, parable there, story here, build up everything, you will be free, you will be free. Follow them home, they themselves are the servants of corruption. But we cannot be free through the deception of those people that are speaking to us. But it's when the word of God grabs you, gets hold of you, and turns you around, and you believe that word, and you accept that word, and you live by that word, it's then you escape the corruption that's in the world through laws. But now it tells us in this verse 4 that I just read to you, that whereby, giving unto us exceedingly great and precious promises, that by these promises will become the partakers of the divine nature. Look at that word partaker. Partaker. Part. Take. You take part in something. Here is the provision of God. And here is the promise of God. Here is the power of God. And you take part in the promise, the power, the provision of God. And when you take part, you become partaker. And then he says, all these exceeding promises that are available for us, was the power of the Almighty God available for us to change our lives, to turn us around. You become a partaker of that divine nature. And you know, when you have the divine nature, that means the nature of God. Your love is commandment. 
you will appreciate his commandment. You'll find it easy to obey the commandments of the Lord. And the word of God and the commandments of God will not be something hard, something grievous for you because you have the nature that is divine. And that nature that is divine, you just love the word of God. You love the commandments of God and you want to do the will of God in heaven, here on earth, as angels do it in heaven. That's why it's very important for you to be a partaker of that divine nature in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 10. Hebrews 12, verse 10. For they, talking about our earthly parents, verily for a few days, chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his... Tell me out loud. Holiness. Of his holiness. Ah, wonderful. You know, if you were just partakers of deeper life holiness, that's something else. If we're just partakers of church holiness, that's something else. If we're just partakers of denominational holiness, that's something else. That will be partakers of his holiness. His holiness doesn't sin once in a while. His holiness doesn't keep holy on Sunday and sin on Monday. His holiness does not live holy in the public and sin in the private. When you get hold of these promises of God and you believe these promises of God, you become partakers of His holiness. And when you are a partaker of His holiness, here with us, if you travel and we are not there and you are alone in that hotel and you are alone with those other people that have not heard what we have heard, have not learned what we have learned, if you are a partaker of his holiness. The holiness you get here will be manifested over there. When your wife is not with you, when your husband is not with you, and when you are with somebody that doesn't believe in holiness, and they want to live a polluted, corrupted life, when you are a partaker of his holiness in that place where you are, you will live a righteous life. We will not be living like chameleon. Righteous in the public, and simple in the private. We will not be living like, you know, people that have no backbone, jellyfish, that they do not have any conviction, and they can compromise anytime. You'll be living in holiness every time because it is His holiness. It says that we might be partakers of His holiness. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14. Hebrews 3, verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ. Partakers of Christ. Partakers of Christ. If we hold fast the beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the end. You see that? When you are a partaker of Christ, you'll be holding fast your confidence in him unto the very end. First Peter chapter 1 puts it in very clear language. First Peter chapter 1. I'm reading to you from verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. He's saying, you're not living like you used to live. You're not drinking what you used to drink. You're not wearing what you used to wear. And you're not going where you used to go. Things have changed now. You are not an obedient children. Don't tell me you are a child of God if you are regularly disobeying the word of God. Deliberately. You know what the word of God says. You know the truth. We make plain and clear to you. We've taught you. And then you deliberately, because of the influence of your friends, because of looking for money, and because you want the praise of men, because you want the good, uh, well done, well done, of people that do not follow the Lord. And then you deliberately disobey the word of God. Don't tell me you're a child of God. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former laws in your ignorance, but as he which has called you is holy. So be ye holy in some manner of conversation. In all. You know there are people that will excuse their unrighteousness. After all, I am good most of the time. Is it most of the time you have to be good or you have to be good at all times? My husband, you are not even grateful. You are still complaining about this one, about that one. Am I not better than before? We're not, we are not asking you to be better than before. We want you to be a new creature in Christ. That's what the word of God says. And you don't justify disobedience, backsliding, compromise, sin in any way, at any time. Because it says, I see which has called you, is holy. 
So be ye holy. The word coming out of your mouth. No more gossiping. No more backbiting. No more evil speaking. That you are holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy. For I am holy. Chapter 2 verse 9. And, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye shall show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And then he tells us, you know, the way these things are. When you read it, it's all, it's, it's all like a string, like a link. This one linking to that one. Everything assuring you and telling you that if we're children of God, and then there's, there's a new creation there. And in Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, verse 19, I speak after the manner of men, because of the infirmity and the weakness and the, uh, the lack of knowledge of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your member servants to uncleanness and, uh, and iniquity unto iniquity, that's in time past, even now, even so now, yield your member servants of righteousness unto holiness, in verse 22. But now, being made free from sin, free from sin, everybody say free from sin. Oh, what a wonderful experience when, when the blood of Jesus cleanses you. And this great power that we're talking about, the divine power, and you become a partaker of his divine nature. And the Lord draws you near. And he says, you are now my child. And you are a member of the family of God, free from sin. Then it says, you become servants to God. And you have your fruit unto holiness. And they end everlasting life. In Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 21. Ephesians 4, 21. If so be that ye have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that he put off. This is your responsibility. That he put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful laws, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and uh, what kind of holiness? Not fake holiness, not counterfeit holiness, not pretending holiness, true holiness, genuine holiness. First Thessalonians chapter 3. In First Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one to another and abound in love one to another and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end, for the purpose, for this reason, ye, might, ye, may, ye may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness, a kind of holiness that no sincere person will be able to find fault. Mark what I said, I said, a kind of holiness that no sincere person will be able to find fault, because no matter how holy you are, even if you are as holy as Jesus, there will be Pharisees that can still find fault. There will be Sadducees that can still find fault. No matter how holy you are, even if you are as holy as John the Baptist, there will be Herods and Herodiah that can still find fault. No matter how holy you are, even if you are as holy as Jesus, there will be a Judas Iscariot that can still betray you and find fault. But a kind of holiness, unblameable in holiness, that no sincere person will be able to find fault. Holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. I pray the Lord will do it today. And in chapter 4, verse 7, for God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. God has not called me, can you say that? Unto uncleanness. But God has called me unto holiness. The Lord is calling you tonight. He's saying, I can forgive your sin. I can cleanse you. I can wash you. I can make you whiter than snow. I'm calling you. I'm not calling you to live in the uncleanness of your past life. I'm calling you unto holiness. And the Lord is standing here just before you. And he's saying, I can make you holy. He has called us unto glory and unto virtue. How many are willing to enter into the holiness of God today? Rise up and tell the Lord, I want to enter in. I want to be a partaker of this divine nature. Don't be in a hurry. Don't be in a hurry. Rise up and tell the Lord 
The reason we study the Bible is so as to be a partaker of the goodness of God, partaker of the provision of God, partaker of the power of God, partaker of the promises of the Lord. Don't go, don't go away, don't go to the toilet now. Come unto the Lord and say, Lord, I hear you are calling me. I hear you are calling me. You are calling me to holiness. You are calling me to glory. You are calling me to virtue. I want to enter in and live the victorious life. The Lord is waiting for you. He will make you live the victorious life. He'll make you a partaker of the divine nature. You'll never be the same again. He'll give you a kind of power, supernatural strength. What made you to fall before? You'll not be, you'll not be falling and rising every day anymore. The power of the Lord will work mightily, work mightily in your life. The chance is yours today. You can come to the Lord and He will give you all the victory you want. You can be victorious in your life.